and welcome to NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. Today, we're coming to you from the Milimani Law Courts here in Nairobi. And this is why we're here. Even those cases which are in court representing uh, suspects who may have killed thousands of elephants or rhinos, those cases must be brought to conclusion. No single case against a government official has been concluded in Kenyan courts today. No single ivory trafficker has gone to jail in this country to date, despite the fact that we have a new law that would put such people in prison for life. We haven't actually convicted a single person yet. According to a report released on the 9th of May 2016 by NGO Traffic that works globally on trade in wild animals and plants, prosecuting wildlife crime in Kenya is still greatly hampered by an inadequate number of wildlife crime prosecutors as well as unclear laws. The report says the inclusion of high minimum penalties has resulted in an increase in not guilty pleas and a consequent rise in the number of trials in a system already suffering from a significant backlog of cases. The report also highlights that corruption among government and private sector officials is a key enabling factor of the illegal wildlife trade. However, traffic says that Kenya has achieved tremendous improvements in tackling wildlife crime. There have been landmark rulings bettering Kenya's once poor sentencing record. According to the World Wildlife Fund, the illegal wildlife trade has exploded to meet increasing demand for elephant ivory, rhino horns and tiger products, particularly in Asia. So now I am inside one of the courtrooms here at the Milimani Law Courts. Not because I'm in trouble, but because I'm about to find out more about what happens in here when it comes to the hearing of wildlife crime cases. And I'm now joined by Liz Guitari. She is an advocate of the High Court and she watches brief for Wildlife Direct when it comes to wildlife cases. Liz, you are standing here, which is where exactly in this courtroom? Well, um, this is the witness box. You okay. can tell it's a witness box because then you have the Bible and the Quran that uh, witnesses can use to swear uh, wow. before they give their testimony. Gosh, I've got to say, it is my first time in a courtroom. That's I've, a good thing. <laughs> that is a good thing, <laughs> yes. Um, but you've actually been in one of these courtrooms yes. uh, many, many times Quite. for good reasons, which we'll come to in just a moment. Mm. But I am curious, and I'm sure my viewers are, uh, to find out more about what this space looks like. Okay. So why don't you take us through? So essentially, if you look at this, this is where the court clerk sits to start with. Over here? Yes, and the job of the court clerk is to assist the judge or the magistrate with cases, calling out case numbers, passing over case files, and anyone who would like to come in and listen on to cases uh, has sitting space at the plenary, which is right over there. And right now, those benches are all empty, empty. benches, um, but I can imagine during court cases, like when you see on TV, they are usually jam-packed. Very, very full, yes. Okay, what and is behind us? This is definitely a very key space. Yes, this is where the judge or the magistrate sits. Okay. And um, it's structured in this way so that then the, he, he or she has complete command of the room and can see any, you know, can hear the witness while he's there and can communicate with the accused persons who are right over there that I'll show Okay, you. take yeah. us through because these are where essentially the so-called bad guys, I won't call them bad guys yet because of course the cases have to uh, go on, but yeah. if you uh, take us and through this stage. So uh, this is uh, the accused person's um, holding area when they're in court and it's longer than the witness box essentially because sometimes you have cases that have more than one accused person. Yeah. Um, so this is where they sit while they're, while they're in court and then their lawyers would sit here at the first benches or prosecution counsel as well would sit here. All right, yeah, I have many a time seen this area very jam-packed, mm -hmm. um, full, full of people looking very unhappy for obvious reasons. <laughs> All right, well, this really is a very, very interesting space to be in. But Liz, I have plenty of questions to ask you because as I said, you spend a lot of time in these courtrooms. So let's take a seat. Okay. 
So Liz, as I said, you are an advocate of the High Court, but you also watch brief for Wildlife Direct when it comes to prosecution cases. Explain to our viewers what that term watching brief really means. It basically just means working with the prosecution to ensure that the case gets handled um, correctly. And uh, for us as Wildlife Direct, we realize that there is need in, in the environment and especially in the judicial process um, to ensure that these cases are, are, are handled correctly, that prosecutors are up to date. And it's not so much as helping or offering help to the prosecutors because we have a fantastic bunch of prosecutors at, at ODPP. Um, it's just generally being the link between the courtroom process of a wildlife crime trial that is of national importance and people. Because as, as you saw while we were walking around the courtroom, mm -hmm. it can get a little bit intimidating for someone who's not used to being in a courtroom. So in as much as you have all these benches that are open to the public, we are able then to sit with the prosecutor and, and uh, sort of brief the public on how the case is going and that sort of thing. So you actually come into court and you witness the, the court sessions and you've witnessed several court sessions. That's why I said earlier that uh, you are very familiar with this environment that we're in here. Why is it so important that you or somebody takes charge of this kind of a job? Smriti, when we started this work in 2012, there was nobody in conservation doing the sort of thing we do. And when we as an NGO, wildlife directors and NGO decided to get into wildlife crime aspect of conservation, everybody was up in arms saying, no, NGOs should do grassroots livelihoods community work. But we realized through a baseline study that we conducted in 2013, January of 2013, that there was a huge gap especially in how cases were prosecuted. At that time, 90%, in fact, 95% of cases were being prosecuted by the police who did not have strict legal training or prosecutorial training for that matter. They were you know, being handled as petty offenses. The law was not supportive at all. So when you say being handled as petty offenses, for example, somebody poaching an elephant and uh, taking its tusks, cutting its tusks out of its face was being handled as a petty offense? Absolutely. In fact, in the 2013 report, we discovered that of all wildlife crime offenses that are handled in Kenyan courts, only 4% of, of, of convicted uh, offenders were actually sent to jail. Everybody else was getting a fine less than 10,000 shillings. Really? But does that have anything to do with the Wildlife Act at the time? Was there a difference? It, it, it did have an, a thing to do with the Wildlife Act, especially because, you know, that was the law. Yeah. And it, the law at that time did not allow for a lot of judicial discretion. Uh, so we, we had a number of recommendations, 10 of them, that we had in the report. And we are really proud to say that 70% of those recommendations have actually been implemented by government. So if you look at the Act now, and the act then, there are tremendous changes in, in, in conservation. If I can just highlight a few, for Please instance, do. the penalty for wildlife crime, it moved from, and especially for elephant and endangered species, uh, crimes impacting endangered species, moved from 40,000 Kenya shillings to 20 million Kenya shillings. Wow, that is a huge exactly. difference. And including a life sentence, right? And for other lower offenses, it's up to 5 million. So in terms of criminality, we've, we've seen a huge um, improvement. The Act, of course, the Wildlife Act, um, is, is a lot harsher now and stricter. But when we look at some of the cases, the prosecutions and the convicted cases, how would you describe uh, Kenya's situation? How well or poorly are we doing? We, we have come a really long way. Uh, conviction rates have almost remained the same. It was 78 in 2013, 77 in 2014, and now in 2015, it's 78 as well. So in terms of conviction rates, it's the same. But what has really been an improvement is the number of people getting jail sentences. And why that is critical is because we need to link the offense and the penalty and to actually make a person or a perpetrator um, 
if I may use the word, feel the cost mm -hmm. of actually committing the offence. Secondly, at that time, we did not have any specialised prosecutors for wildlife crime with special training to prosecute and trial advocacy for wildlife crime. And I must commend the Office of the DPP for really uh, taking into account the recommendations we gave of having a specialised unit. He gazetted 35 prosecutors oh, wow. and we are hoping that he will add more. Um, and, and they're now prosecuting, they're, they got training specifically to prosecute wildlife offences. We're in the process of setting up a prosecutions unit at KWS, mm -hmm. which will handle the lower level sort of offence. Of course, and that's one of the commitments that Kenya has made. That came out of uh, the Giants Club Summit. Uh, Professor Judy Wakungu, the CS for Environment, uh, laid out five commitments and that was one of them. Kenya commits to the creation of an in-house prosecution unit within KWS that helps achieve a major lift in conviction rates and associated penalties for those involved in wildlife crime. Uh, clearly a very important one. Absolutely, and, and uh, the thing that we're actually saying is this, that yes, there's training and you have prosecutors or you have human capital to actualize, but if they do not have the tools to enable them to do their job, then we, you know, we'll just be turning on a wheel like a hamster, right? right? And, and uh, the Office of the Chief Justice as well, and, and I'm glad that we're in a courtroom to, to discuss this, has instituted criminal case management systems that were piloted using wildlife crimes, especially in Mombasa, mm -hmm. that have really worked a miracle in terms of speeding up the cases. Because in our 2015 report, um, it showed that the time gap between arrest and not even arrest between arraignment in court and a wildlife crime case to completion within a year only about 30 percent of cases get completed really? right and especially when you're dealing with um, things that have uh, historically been deemed petty offenses it's very easy to sweep such statistics under the rug right. but we're really happy that the, the Ch office of the chief justice has taken this up we are having even a lot more magistrates actually being um, conscious and having a background into exactly what a wildlife offense is mm -hmm. so when an accused person for instance is, sits at that dock and he is charged with killing a dick dick the magistrate will actually go on or, or trafficking in dick dick meat or bush meat mm -hmm. he will actually he or she will actually look at the charge sheet and ask how many kgs of bush meat was it because if it's one kg then you probably just were getting it for food to feed your family yeah but if it's a pickup load heading to Burma market yeah. then you're a businessman of and course. that's an economic um, aspects to Yeah, well let's, um, if I may, talk about uh, some more of the accused people because uh, there was a big case that's still ongoing here in Kenya and that is Faisal Mohammed. In December 2014, Faisal Muhammad Ali, a wanted man by Interpol, was arrested in Tanzania. Faisal was wanted for dealing in wildlife trophies after being found in possession of 314 pieces of ivory weighing more than two tons, the equivalent of at least 114 poached elephants, during a raid in June 2014. Faisal is the alleged leader of an ivory smuggling group. He has remained in custody since, but just this week, Faisal's case failed to proceed at the Mombasa Law Courts. The defendant's lawyer requested for their submissions to be heard in court on the 23rd of May 2016. You have been following that case very closely. Are you able to comment on it? I am not able to comment on it, especially because, like you've rightly said, we are watching brief on it. And it's not that it hasn't picked up. We've actually finished with the prosecution witnesses and we will be giving submissions in court. And so we'll, it's really in the hands of the magistrates. All right. So on the magistrates end, why does it seem to be taking quite a bit of time? It's been a few years now. I, I would probably ask that magistrate that question after that case is completed. Right. Because, of course, there are challenges such as uh, lengthy cases, um, some sluggishness in court. Um, could you name some of the other challenges uh, that you witness uh, in the courtroom? Mm. So Wildlife Direct does a, has a courtroom monitoring um, program where we monitor cases, uh, wildlife crime cases across the country. And one of the things that we have isolated is that this issue of corruption and especially corruption hiding behind incompetence 
and, and lack of capacity. So you find a, a badly drafted church sheet or a witness who's gotten intimidated by an accused person, you know, that sort of thing. So how we are handling it and we're encouraging everybody in the sector to actually, and by in the sector I mean NGOs and, and, and organizations, is to provide mentorship uh, services to these prosecutors. And on top of that, to actually go to a courtroom and sit while you know a case is being heard. Mm. And we have proper uh, processes in which to raise these concerns. For instance, we have a judicial ombudsman. What we are trying to do is to address the ignorance in it. So that's, that's one challenge. The second challenge is that uh, the issue of transfers within within the judicial mechanism and mm. ODPP's office. We, we acknowledge that in government and especially in civil service, you know, you'll work four years here and get transferred to another station, which in a, in a way, it's a good thing because then you don't have time to entrench corruption cartels, mm. right? But then the problem comes in when, you, when organizations or DPP or KWS have invested a lot of resources to train magistrates right. or prosecutors and then those magistrates are sent to an area that does not have wildlife crime or is not yeah. prevalent. How do we compare for example to our neighbours Tanzania because a very key case um, is about to pick up uh, on Monday in fact in Tanzania that is the case of the Ivory Queen. 66-year-old Chinese woman Yang Fenglan, known as the Ivory Queen, is accused of leading one of Africa's biggest ivory smuggling rings. In October 2015, she was captured and charged. She is accused of smuggling 706 elephant tusks from Tanzania to the Far East and is said to have been a crucial link between East African poaching syndicates and buyers in China. The Ivory Queen's case is finally set to begin in Tanzania on Monday, May 16th. She denies the charges against her, but if found guilty, she faces up to 30 years in jail. Uh, what are the expectations um, looking ahead at that case? Well, when that arrest was made last year, at Wildlife Direct we were very optimistic in the sense of here is a country that has actually acknowledged a person who has allegedly committed these offences over a period of time mm -hmm. and actually connects it to an organised cartel. Now, we still do not have that in Kenya. We do have cases, we have uh, several cases pending in court where alternative legislation has been used and in particular the Organised Crimes Act, mm -hmm. right? but we still have not had a proper case study where a prosecutor has come to court and said, I am prosecuting this case as an organized and the organized crimes act because this person and this person and this person are part of this cartel mm -hmm. and this person kills, this person traffics and this person buys. We don't have that yet. And so in a way it's a good, it's, it's a good thing that Tanzania was, were able to actually do that. The stakes are high in that case because I can assure you for someone who has, you know, existed for that number of years involved in that business, mm -hmm. they must have had some very high level protection, right? And networks across mm -hmm. to, you know, the Far East. So we, we are apprehensive about corruption. We are apprehensive about witness tampering. But we are, we are confident that the Tanzanian uh, authorities will actually uh, be able to handle this. And we are happy that their new president is actually <laughs> pro-conservation. <Yep. laughs> right. Well, that certainly is something to, to wait and watch. I, but uh, Liz, you mentioned uh, certain issues, uh, cartels, corruptions, um, protection as well. I have seen many headlines in the newspapers about um, former GSU officer or policeman found in wh wherever, Narok for example, uh, with, uh, with rhino horn. What comes of cases such as those? What we are trying to do currently is to ensure that every single case in the country where a government official or a public official is involved we institute disciplinary proceedings with the particular oversight authority concerned. For instance, if it's a police officer with, the, uh, with IPOA, or if it's with judiciary, then the JSC and so on and so forth. And actually shine a light on them. Because if we do not talk about it, 
and in fact if we do not shout about it then these cases are going to get swept under the rug and in most cases you will find that it, let's assume it's a magistrate who's been or a judicial officer who's been caught you know mangled up in wildlife crime mm. or trafficking in ivory and they are you know standing over there and their colleague is listening yeah. to the case and this is someone probably who they've gone out to lunch with at some sure. point so it is possible you know the court is not just the structure mm -hmm. it is also a humane court because it is held by a human being and the human being will be you know the judge or the magistrate so right. we're we are trying to plug in all of these issues and really have a conversation about integrity and and uh, integrity and and corruption at every chance that we get because it is true that you cannot legislate corruption mm -hmm. out of a country and it really has to do with a change in mentality and for every uh, person who receives a, a bribe in government there's a private citizen who's paid that bribe. Certainly, yeah. certainly. Well Liz, uh, you certainly have highlighted many of the positives. Uh, we are as a country making headway. Uh, there has been a significant improvement but still so many challenges, some of them the usual ones, corruption for example. Uh, but perhaps at least we are on the right track. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks very much indeed for speaking Thank to you. us on NTV Wild Talk. Uh, we are about to take a breather, but after the break, do stay tuned because we'll be taking you through a mock court session uh, to see what happens in court in uh, many parts of the country and also across uh, the continent. Uh, Liz Guitari um, features as one of the actors uh, in that mock court session. But first, here is our Wild Guess question. Your chance to win an awesome prize. Our Wild Guess question is, what is the penalty in Kenya for wildlife crime impacting endangered species? What is the penalty in Kenya for wildlife crime impacting endangered species? Use the hashtag NTV Wild on Twitter or like our NTV Wild Facebook page and post your answer on the timeline. Private messages won't be considered. The first person to answer correctly wins a delicious meal voucher for two for up to 4,000 shillings at Mambo Italia, a fabulous Italian restaurant at the Garden City Mall, plus one bottle of wine courtesy of Wines of the World and a gift hamper courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. We're coming to you from the Milimani Law Courts here in Nairobi. First, a reminder of our Wild Guest question. Our wild guess question is, what is the penalty in Kenya for wildlife crime impacting endangered species? What is the penalty in Kenya for wildlife crime impacting endangered species? Use the hashtag NTV Wild on Twitter or like our NTV Wild Facebook page and post your answer on the timeline. Private messages won't be considered. The first person to answer correctly wins a delicious meal voucher for two for up to 4,000 shillings at Mambo Italia, a fabulous Italian restaurant at the Garden City Mall, plus one bottle of wine courtesy of Wines of the World and a gift hamper courtesy of Wildlife Direct. Now the show today is focusing on the judicial process when it comes to wildlife crime cases. When we were in Nanuki for the Giants Club Summit at the end of April, the organization Space for Giants put together a mock courtroom to demonstrate what happens in many courtrooms across the country and the continent when prosecuting wildlife crime cases. Now led by Shamini Jayanathan, the legal director for Space for Giants, four scenes were acted out by Shamini, Liz and other actors to give us an example. She says that the court process must be addressed. Now the first scene demonstrates what happens when the first accused person first appears in court. He's just been arrested, he's coming to court to be arraigned and face the charges and the two most important decisions that a prosecutor makes at the beginning of a case are the decision whether to charge him and what to charge him with and also the decision to bail. John Abwa will be playing defence counsel, Elizabeth Guattari will be the prosecutor, um, Samuel Guthoy will be the clerk of the court, um, and Jared Akule is going to play a police officer and also a witness in one scene. And Rod Potter is obviously going to be the defendant. Let's begin. <laughs> Accordingly, Your Honour, the prosecution calls for an adjournment in this particular case. All right, I'll grant an adjournment. I think you're needed, Madam Prosecutor. Can I just have a moment? We'll call the next case on, please. The state against 
Judge Okello. Do you have a charge sheet? I do, Your Honour. Right. Stand up, please, Mr. Okello. Um, Judge Okello, you are charged on this date with an offence of being in possession of wildlife trophy, contrary to Section 4 of the Wildlife Act 2015. Namely that, on... Can you fill in the dates, please? On the 26th of... 26th day of April, 2016, at 16 Riverside Lane, Victoria County, you were in possession of 20 kilograms of ivory horn without permit. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. All right, you can sit down. Your Honour, <coughs> may it please you, may I be placed on record on behalf of the accused person? Certainly. Madam Prosecutor, how many witnesses are required in this case? We will have three, four, uh, five, five, Your Honour. And how many days the trial? Um, three. Trial set for the 6th of June. What's the bail position? Um, we, we do oppose bail, Your Honour. On what grounds? Um, it's a serious offence and the ever is worth a lot of money. Uh, isn't this Rhino Horn? <laughs> Yes, sorry, my, my apologies, Your Honor. Yes, it's Rhino Horn and it's worth a lot of money. And if, if this gentleman is convicted, he will definitely go to prison. Well, I'm not sure he will go to prison. I mean, rhinos are just wild animals, a little more than large cows, aren't they? All right, is that all you have to say? <laughs> yes, Your Honor. Counsel? Your Honor, we wish to submit that suspicion, however strong it may be, is not a basis for conviction. We pray that the accused person be admitted to bail for reason that he has no past conviction record. He is an esteemed member of the community and at the same time is an official in the local county. And being admitted to bail is a constitutional right and we pray that he be admitted to bail. I totally agree. I see no reason to hold this man on custody on any charge concerning wildlife. Bail is granted. You can leave the court, Mr. Akello. What your, is it, Madam Prosecutor? Your Honour, if, if I may seek leave of court to amend the charge sheet. To what? We, apparently, we do have an additional charge for possession of a firearm. Right. Do you have anything to say? Your Honour, I wish to express my, uh, my deepest disappointment because this is, uh, this is an, ambush, ambu uh, an ambush from the prosecution. Uh, well, however sloppy the prosecution case may appear at this point, it is his, your client's first appearance. I don't see that he's a real risk of a miscarriage of justice. I'll allow the application. Have you drafted the charge? No, no, Your Honour. Right, so I'll give you five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Court so that was scene one of the mock courtroom session played out by Shamini Jayanathan, Liz Gitari and other actors as well, giving us a sense of what really happens in some of our courtrooms when wildlife crimes are being heard. Here now is further explanation from Shamini about what really went on. So in that scene, what we have here is a prosecutor being asked to make a decision on charge and on bail whilst on her feet handling sometimes as many as up to 60 other cases in a busy court listing. She's had no time to read the papers, no time to assess the evidence, no time to consider ancillary legal orders, no time to even address her mind as to whether in fact there is a case. She's entirely reliant upon the opinion of the investigating officer who may not be aware of all the relevant legal points that pertain to that particular case. Accordingly, when a case gets started like that, we can see that she's already annoyed the judge at the complete waste of judicial time. Um, she's already at a disadvantage and she's likely going to spend the rest of that case putting out fires. And now we move on to a second scenario that provides a very simple solution. The state against Judge Okello. Are you ready to proceed, Madam Prosecutor? Yes, Your Honour, I am ready to proceed. I had a pre-charge conference with the investigating officer in this case, and we are preferring two charges against the accused person. One, uh, possession of the proceeds of crime being uh, a rhino horn in this particular case, and two, possession, illegal possession of a firearm, Your Honour. All right, we'll hear the charges. Stand, please. Judge Okello, you are charged on this indictment with two counts. 
The first being one count of possession of, of proceeds of crime, contrary to section 38 of the Proceeds of Crime Act, namely that on 26th of April 2016, you were in possession of a proceed of crime, namely 20 kilograms of ivory horn, contrary to section 38 of the Proceeds of Crime Act 2014. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. On the second count, you are charged with possession of a firearm, contrary to section 2 of the Firearm Act 2000. Namely that on 26th of April 2016, you were in possession of a specified firearm, namely AK-47, without a license. Do you plead guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. All right, sit down. How long is this trial going to take? You know. Yes? May it please you. Of course. My name is John Abuor. May I be placed on record on behalf of the accused person? Indeed. How long is this trial going to take, Madam Prosecutor? I intend to take four full trial days in this particular case. I have six witnesses, including a forensic expert. Uh, I would also like at this stage to indicate to the court that we are currently, uh, we have ongoing investigations, financial investigations under the Proceeds of Crimes Act. I would also like to inform you <coughs> that this morning we lodged an interlocutory application at the High Court asking for the freezing of the defendant's assets well. uh, duly uh, and consequently then if in the event that he is convicted, I will still be coming before you asking for forfeiture of his vehicle where the items are found. Very well. Defence counsel, what's the issue in this case? Your Honour, this is a classic case of mistaken identity, false accusation. It is not him. <laughs> well, all right then. Are you disputing that it's Rhino Horn? Do we no. really have to trouble a forensic expert to come to court? Your Honour, at this particular stage, it is an allegation. It is up to the prosecution to prove mm -hmm. this their case. Yes, well, I do know that, Mr. Bois. I'll set it down for a pre-trial conference on the 4th of May, so we can hopefully narrow the issues down. Trial is set for the 6th of June and all disclosure to be completed by the 30th of May. Prosecutor, what is the bail position? Your Honour, we do oppose bail <coughs> and on two grounds. One, the seriousness of the offences uh, under which the accused person has been charged. In the first count, uh, if he is convicted, he faces a minimum conviction and, and prison sentence of three years in prison. Mm -hmm. And on the second count, a minimum imprisonment sentence of five years in prison. Uh, the second uh, reason that we're relying on, Your Honor, is that this case is heavily reliant on identification uh, evidence and the, our key witness who recognizes and has undergone a successful identification parade with the accused person is very well known to the accused person and in the event that he is released, he is definitely going to tamper with that witness. What do you have to say about it, Mr. Abwa? <laughs> Your Honor. Mere allegations is not a basis for conviction. We pray that accused person be admitted to bail. Is an esteemed member of the community. Is a very highly ranked person working within the county. And at the same time, bail <coughs> is an, a constitutional right. And therefore, we pray that the accused person be admitted to bail. I would have thought the fact your client is a public official rather aggravates the position, Mr. Abois, given what we know about the illegal wildlife trade and its links to corruption and transnational crime. Bail is denied. Court of John. So the mock courtroom session really is getting more and more interesting. And this really is what happens in some courtrooms. Sharmini now explains further. The key to the efficiency and strength of the prosecution presentation at that first appearance was very simple. It was early engagement with the investigation um, authorities. It was early engagement with the police. And behind the scenes, a more prosecution-led approach to investigations. Coupled with guidance on bail that can be offered to officers so that they can put a coherent argument um, towards the prosecutor relating to the issue of bail um, and allow her to consider all the facts, the prosecutor is in a much more strengthened position when it comes to that first appearance at court. Um, here in Kenya, a very simple toolkit, this is the second edition, the first edition was done last year, um, was created. Um, and it creates a, it's called a points to prove guidance and it sets out all the ingredients in a very simple way for investigators and prosecutors and forces them to address their mind to the ingredients of an offence before a charging decision is even made. 
It also includes guidance on bail, forcing the prosecutor and the police officer to address the grounds on which you might oppose bail. And most importantly, it includes a standard operating procedure that demands early and continued engagement between the investigator and the prosecutor. And we're already seeing the results here in Kenya with an increase of 17% um, of the number of ivory cases that are successfully prosecuted. And we're also seeing for the first time major traffickers now being prosecuted. And that's really down to that early engagement, prosecution-led approaches to investigation. It's a very simple solution, but it has a very big impact. All right, and now to the next scene, which is all about the first day of trial. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. We are ready to proceed. Our witnesses, we have three witnesses who are presently not in court, but we can proceed as the officer just gets them. All right, counsel, are you ready? Your Honor, I wish to apply for an adjournment for reason that the prosecution have failed to disclose a vital prosecution, uh, prosecution statement, and therefore we, we will not proceed. Is that true? Um, that appears to be true, Your Honor. All right, well, I'll grant an adjournment. We'll list this case for trial on uh, 5th of July. All rise. Hey, hey! I'm your witness. I'm here. This is the copy of my bond. What is happening? Oh, I'm so sorry. This trial has been moved to 5th of July. Just come back on 5th of July. But I just took a day off from work. <coughs> and it took me three hours to reach here. Now, see, the defenders for me are outside there and they're saying that I should look my back. I'm not coming back. I'm telling you, if you're not in court on the 5th of July, I am going to arrest you. What? What do you mean? You are threatening me. You are a witness. I I'm not coming back. You. Then do whatever you like. <laughs> now, according to Shamini, that sort of a scene is played out in lots of courts across many jurisdictions across the country and, in fact, across the continent. A culture of adjournments pervades many courts. Um, at the expense of the needs of the witnesses and to the huge disadvantage to both the prosecution and in fact the defence. It leads only to witness attrition, witness fatigue, they don't want to cooperate anymore. You get case files that are lost, you get exhibits that get lost, you get transfer of personnel. Judges get moved off cases, defence counsel change, prosecutors change. The whole case is, that suddenly becomes more and more compromised the longer and longer it drags on. And now to the next scene where the prosecutor, acted by Liz Gitari, is ready to proceed. She has had a pre-trial conference, but the counsel is not ready to proceed for trial. Your Honor, I'm not ready for reason that a vital prosecution step, a witness statement has not been supplied. We is that pray for your time? kind indulgence that we get another date. Is that true? It does appear that that particular witness statement he's referring to was not disclosed, Your Honor. What does that statement relate to? It's just a ranger who happened along the scene of crime after the defendant had been arrested and the scene of crime had already been secured. Does he give identification evidence? No, he doesn't. Is he here? Yes, he is. Was he on the list of witnesses that you gave to the defence, that initial disclosure? He was, he was, Your Honor. Counsel, when did you inform the prosecutor that you hadn't received that statement? Your Honor, we didn't. Counsel, when did you inform the court that you wanted this case listed for a mention to seek an adjournment of this trial? Your Honor, we are sorry we did. All right. Well, I'm extremely confident in your ability to digest this statement over the lunchtime at break. Madam Prosecutor, you may have to call that witness out of term this afternoon, but we have witnesses waiting, Mr Abwar. The trial will proceed as planned. Court of John. And that was the end of the mock trial. The final scene, Sharmini, now summarises all the events. The difference between those two scenarios, again, is a very simple one again. It's about management of the case by way of a judge-driven process that demands that the prosecutor and the defence play their part. It's a simple change of expectation. Um, here in Kenya, a pilot called Active Case Management was launched in December 2015, and it was launched in three pilot courts. And we're already seeing, just four months on, an increase in the effectiveness of the first trial hearing. We're seeing a decrease in the number of adjournments um, between those cases. And of course, the buy-in, again, for achieving um, a buy-in for a pilot like that, lay in achieving or, or obtaining proper data in the way that cases are handling, are being handled in the courts, because it provides an evidential platform to then go to the Chief Justice, to go to the head of the judiciary and say, this is what's actually happening and these are the solutions. So unless we address, as I said at the start of this, the way in which decisions are made, um, on charges and bail, and the way in which cases progress through the trial, all our efforts at training and sensitization of judges will not have the desired impact that we want if the desired impact we want is a high rate of convictions and a deterrent effect upon would-be poachers. 
So now you get a bigger, better sense of what really happens in some of the courtrooms across the country, especially when it comes to cases of wildlife crime. Clearly, a lot more needs to be done. But as we heard earlier in part one, Kenya is on the right track. So that's it for the judicial process surrounding wildlife for crime. Now we turn our attention to our new wild pick segment. It's a lot of fun. I had a great time going through all your photos. Here's what I found. This photo was sent in by Susan Wangari. Susan was at the Sheldrick Falls in the Shimba Hills National Reserve. She was enjoying the waterfalls and she went there to learn more about the falls. We also have Telefode Georges, who was in the Nairobi orphanage. He was cleaning Bolt, the cheetah's cage, and he was cleaning it because he feels wild animals need our care too. Then there's Morris Onwonga. This photo was taken at the Uti Hills in India. Him and his friends attempted to go to a freezing 5 degrees Celsius zone of the hills. And why? Because they love nature. Monica Oyugi sent this picture, which was taken 35 kilometers from the Maasai Mara. It captured the view of the Mara and she did this to show her family that she finally saw the Mara River, which she's always wanted to do. And Kunali Dodia sent in a photo. It was a selfie of her in the Nairobi National Park. She was there on a game drive and why does she go? To show her children and also to create awareness. All you need to do is like our NTV Wild Facebook page and send in your photo via private message. But remember, you must include your full name. Tell us where the photo was taken, what you were doing and why. So get out there and get clicking and your photo could feature in our next show. So if you haven't done so already, please do send in your photos so we can see that you take a real interest in wildlife, the environment and nature. Now here's what's coming up on the NTV Wild documentary series on Saturday night. Imagine a safari that starts on the equator. A safari that goes up the headwaters of the Nile and along the edge of the Aturi. Africa's largest and most exciting rainforest. This is Virunga. Mountain gorillas are the best known of Virunga's animals, and it was for them that the park was originally created. Mountain gorillas are one of the rarest and most spectacular animals in Africa. And that's it on NTV Wild Talk with me, Smriti Vidyarthi. We have been discussing the judicial process when it comes to wildlife crime cases. Thanks for watching. See you again Tuesday, 10 p.m.